The Hedonistic Imperative is uh, the name of a manifesto I wrote back in uh, 1995. Mm -hmm. uh, the Hedonistic Imperative calls for the use of biotechnology to phase out the biology of suffering throughout the living world, uh, to reprogram the biosphere and to replace the biology of misery and malaise with transhuman, post-human life based on gradients of intelligent bliss. Um, and I stress the intelligent bliss because this isn't the idea that of a kind of uniform euphoria. This is the idea that we can ratchet up our hedonic range and hedonic set points with the aid of genetic engineering so that uh, all of us can enjoy uh, lifelong gradients of well-being. What will transhuman and post-human life be like? Um, the only sensible answer I can, I can give you is uh, I don't know. But one of the many reasons for stressing recalibration is that by raising hedonic set points, it's not necessary for you or mo almost anyone else to sacrifice their existing values and preferences. Uh, crudely, it just means that you can wake up in the morning uh, feeling in a, a fantastically uh, good mood and pursue whatever you consider most valuable or worthwhile as now. now that's a rather bioconservative answer. In practice, I think uh, mastery of our reward circuitry, intelligence amplification, radical life extension is going to transform the nature of uh, of, of life in ways that uh, far beyond the pleasure pain uh, axis but uh, yes I regard a, a precondition of any civilized society is that we get rid of uh, involuntary suffering any state below hedonic zero Essentially, evolution didn't design us to be happy. Other things being equal, it is good to be discontented a lot of the time. Instead of counting your blessings, as philosophers have urged us to do, essentially being restless, wanting more reproductive opportunities, more wealth, more status, it's adaptive. Uh, and. So essentially, most people spend at least some of their lives, and tragically in many cases a lot of their lives, extremely unhappy and resentful. However, it is possible to study today's hedonic outliers. Some people, yes, they spend their lives essentially below hedonic zero, uh, gradients of misery, but at the opposite extreme, there are a small minority of people with exceptionally high hedonic set points who can live high functioning lives, but essentially gradients of well-being. And the first step, uh, really, I would say, is to tweak our genomes and ensure that uh, future humans and transhumans have a vastly higher hedonic set point. Tweaking our genomes is extremely problematic. Uh, so why do it? Uh, because essentially every child today born is a unique, untested genetic experiment. And if you regard it as ethically permissible to bring more life and suffering into the world, then I think you have an obligation to maximize the opportunities of your future child to flourish. And that means loading the genetic dice. Now, with the advent of the first uh, CRISPR babies, uh, essentially, in principle, all prospective parents can be offered access to pre-implantation genetic screening and counselling and now within the next few years in principle the opportunity to choose everything from pain thresholds of their 
of their future children. Uh, there's a single master gene that seems to act as the kind of the volume knob for pain, the SCN9A gene. Two, and this is more complicated, the opportunity to choose benign alleles and allelic variations uh, that essentially set the approximate hedonic set point of your future child. Recall that the hedonic set point is the kind of uh, set of negative feedback mechanisms in the central nervous system that stop most of us being very happy or very sad for long. And what we want to do uh, ethically, I think, is to ratchet up hedonic range and hedonic set points. But you ask about problems, yes, countless problems. Uh, essentially, today we conduct uh, genetic experiments and we are going to continue to do so. Uh, I mean, personally, I, as a, as a so-called soft antinatalist, I'm not at all convinced that it's ethically permissible to bring more involuntary life and suffering into the world, but the future belongs to fanatical life lovers. Uh, and whereas antinatalism is an evolutionary, an evolutionary dead end, uh, the idea of phasing out the biology of suffering and replacing it by information-sensitive gradients of bliss can unite everything from negative utilitarians and Buddhists to classical utilitarians and life lovers of any, of any kind. I think it's potentially a winning strategy. I mean, after all, the World Health Organization and its founding constitution of 1990, uh, sorry, uh, of 1948 actually defines health as complete physical, mental, social well-being. Now, that's an extraordinarily uh, ambitious definition. Probably no one alive today has enjoyed health by that definition, but we can aim for something a little less uh, ambitious, which is information-sensitive gradients of well-being. But to achieve this World Health Organization conception of or anything like this conception of health, we're going to have to uh, get to yeah the genetic root of the problem. I mean, I'm probably sounding like a rather crude genetic determinist. Uh, I'm not. Essentially, a twin track approach is 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 needed to the problem of suffering. Get rid of getting rid of all kinds of social ills, scrapping factory farming, slaughterhouses, uh, going on to actually reprogram uh, nature and the rest of the living world. But uh, yeah, essentially, if we're not to be having this discussion in uh, 100, 500, or even 5,000 years' time, we're going to have to tackle the biological genetic root of the problem, which is essentially that. Mother Nature uh, didn't design us to be happy, where, uh, but uh, biotechnology uh, gives us the tools for the job. Someone with a very low hedonic set point, uh, depressive, uh, is likely to remain uh, depressive uh, if they contract terminal uh, cancer unless they're uh, given euphoriant drugs, morphine and so forth. Whereas someone who is temperamentally happy, a high hedonic set point, uh, may well cope with the challenges of even something terrible like cancer uh, uh, far better. But the question I'd say is just, yeah, imagine we were to encounter an advanced civilization that had phased out disease, pain, in suffering, and essentially they did leave, lead lives based on gradients of intelligent bliss. Would we urge them to revert to the kind of ancestral horrors of uh, pain, depression, jealousy, discontent, all the kind of the nastiness that is endemic to uh, Darwinian life? I think they would probably regard anyone who is urging this as in the grip of a depressive psychosis and candidly I think they'd be right. Well clearly uh, the idea of a world without suffering is is 
ancient, there's a kind of religious or utopian uh, dream. It's been you know, central to the whole Buddhist tradition. Gautama Buddha, I right, teach one thing, suffering and the end of uh, end of suffering. Um, but what's really changed is the technical tools to turn utopian dreaming into uh, practical practical reality. Um, and yeah, I mean, I was very struck as a teenager by wireheading. This is the idea that intracranial self-stimulation of the reward centers shows no tolerance. And this, unlike most people, but this actually struck me as actually wonderful. Life without pain. I was a, a depressive, melancholy child who brooded on the nature of suffering and the awfulness of life. But this seemed to offer hope. But of course, most people, if you know, the first time they come across this idea of, 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 of wire hitting, they recoil at the prospect. And in order to be practically sociologically credible, one needs to sketch out a scenario in which uh, it's possible to preserve intelligence, critical insight, social responsibility, personal development. And so, yes, just uh, thinking, reading about, yeah, kind of uh, genetic engineering, nanotechnology. Um, the final piece of the jigsaw to me, as far as I was concerned, actually came after I had written the hedonistic imperative much more recently, the advent of uh, gene drives, synthetic gene drives. That uh, uh, So it's actually going to be possible to uh, essentially push benign genes across entire species, even if naively they carry a fitness cost to the individual. But um, yeah, the core, essentially the core idea of hedonistic imperative, uh, I suppose I had quite, quite an early age, this is yeah, essentially the idea of replacing uh, the biology of pleasure and pain with the biology of gradients of, of, of well-being. Um, now, uh, yeah, I'm, <laughs> how far do we go? You know, the full-blown hedonistic imperative, I suspect, uh, yes, our, our post-human descendants will actually enjoy life that is, if today it's, let's say, crudely, schematically, minus 10 to zero to plus 10, uh, eventually civilization might take place on a plane of plus 72 to plus 100 but this is much more speculative and much further into the uh the future um but uh for now i think uh yeah our overriding priority is to get rid of these uh, these sub-zero states and uh the first step for humans at any rate uh, is going to be universal access to pre-implantation genetic screening and counseling uh, in the case of non-human animals, before even thinking of reprogramming the rest of the biosphere, uh, I think we need to uh, scrap factory farms and slaughterhouses, which are a disgrace to our civilization. Uh, uh, pigs, for example, as, are as sentient and sapient as, uh, as, as, as human toddlers. It's not a case of genetically tweaking uh, pigs. Uh, essentially, it's to, it's to stop, stop harming them. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, the technical details are, are daunting, but what daunts me more than anything else are the political, sociological obstacles. And though, at least in principle, I could sketch you out a kind of 100-year uh, plan to defeat suffering in line with the WHO constitution. In practice, I suspect several hundred years of, of, of pain and misery still lead, lead ahead, I, uh, still lie ahead, but I hope I'm wrong. Essentially, it's just status quo bias. Um, that's not the whole story. I and mean, if uh, sooner or later someone is probably going to say, well, isn't this eugenics or isn't this brave new world? Um, but uh, yeah, uh, needless to say, the you know, uh, 
the purpose of you know Nazi race hygiene policy and eugenics was not to create the well-being of all uh, of all sentience uh, and Brave New World, uh, though not nearly as bad as as National Socialism. Some people uh, recoil at the idea of, of 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 Soma and the idea that if we were all happy, we would become essentially just dupes of the ruling elite. But just to tackle that uh, particular uh, uh, objection, um, it's interesting today that. Uh, that subordinate behavior is not associated with with happiness it's associated with uh, with, with 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 depression and low mood and other things being equal if you ratchet up people's hedonic set points they're more likely to be active citizens um, but this is yeah a case that needs to be made uh, if people you know the first time they stumble across the idea you know if, if one's comes across an idea one wants to shoehorn it into existing stereotypes and I think many people are likely to say eugenics or brave new world. Oh, there's a lot to uh, unpack there. Um, in the case of meaning, uh, other things being equal, the happiest people uh, tend to find life most meaningful. No one says, I feel blissfully happy, but my life feels empty and meaningless. Uh, sadly, it's people who are depre depressive, experience low mood, who tend to feel life empty. And in the more extreme cases of depression, this shades into nihilistic despair. And so rather than there being some kind of contrast between a life of happiness and a life of meaning, if we ratchet up our hedonic range and hedonic set points, life is likely to become super meaningful. Yes, it is true that out of the depths of despair have come works of great art and literature, uh, but uh, we have grounds for thinking that with the use of biotechnology, it's going to be possible to isolate the molecular signature of aesthetic experience of the sublime and beautiful and ratchet this up too. So it may well be that transhumans and posthumans will be able to experience a backdrop of superhuman beauty every day of their lives and what passes for artistic achievement today may seem as, uh, as, as trivial and banal as painting by numbers. Um. Two things I'd say, one uh, technical, uh, one more sociological. Uh, a new uh, opioid receptor has been or dual function receptor has been discovered in the brain uh, that promises uh, essentially hedonic uplift it's part it seems to be part of the uh, the negative feedback mechanisms in, in the brain that stop most of us being happy most of the time um, we all know uh, exogenous opioids have countless problems but if it were possible that your native endogenous opioid function uh, were richer in theory at any rate with the help of this receptor if one blocks it and a, a drug has been de experimentally devised that does block it this actually promises in theory hedonic uplift for everyone counts as pitfalls to consider. I probably shouldn't have uh, introduced it uh, right at the, <laughs> uh, right now, but this is actually an exciting development for the future of mental health and the treatment of chronic pain conditions. But what I would really look forward to uh, is some big name charismatic billionaire, perhaps uh, Elon Musk, to say, Let's use biotechnology to get rid of suffering throughout the living world. Because after all, we live in a fame-based culture. And 
it's, it's essentially if some big name charismatic uh, figure, uh, you know, kind of an Elon Musk says something like this, the media takes notice. Um, uh, Neur Neuralink, of course, has been in the news almost as a, as, as, as a thro throwaway. Elon Musk uh, mentioned how it should be possible to use uh, Neuralink to eradicate uh, pain and depression. I mean, it's not his primary focus, but it would be wonderful if there could be some kind of sociological, sociological breakthrough because the technical preconditions uh, are now in place for a, a world a world without suffering uh, with recognizable extensions of existing technologies but it's going to take uh, yeah uh, not, not merely a technical revolution but a socio-political revolution too for more debates talks and interviews subscribe today to the Institute of art and ideas at IAI TV